Okay, we're moving into an, another exciting panel discussion now. I'm going to introduce the moderator. Uh, Jacqueline Tame is the inaugural director of government affairs at SciQuantum. Uh, they're a company that's building the world, world's first useful fault-tolerant error-corrected quantum computer. Um, prior to her role at SciQuantum, Jacqueline was VP uh, in, of Innovation at Landis, a multi-billion dollar agricultural co-op in Iowa. And before joining Landis, Jacqueline served as the Acting Deputy Director Inaugural Chief Performance Officer of the Department of Defense's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Uh, SciQuantum is a platinum sponsor of this conference. We certainly appreciate them uh, in that capacity as well. She started her career uh, at the CIA, leading a team of futures analysts to inform strategic acquisition and investment um, planning uh, for the agency. Um, SciQuantum, again, is a fantastic partner. They have a session later today as well where you'll hear, hear some more exciting news. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jacqueline Tame to the stage as our moderator. Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. Thank you so much uh, for having us. We're really excited to be here. I'm Jacqueline Tame. Uh, Stu, thank you very much for the introduction, wherever you went. I'm really, really pleased to uh, introduce my, my co-panelists here. Uh, we have a really great lineup for you all, and I want to just give a few minutes of, of overview on their background, because I think it speaks to their, to their expertise and, and the, the type of conversation that we'll be able to have today because of that. Um, so I'm going to start actually on the very, uh, your right, my left, Justin. Justin Finelli is currently the technical director of the, of the Department of Navy's PEO Digital and also the acting uh, chief technology officer of the Navy. He also serves in an advisory role to ARPA-H, um, is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, an investor and venture partner, and he has a ton of experience uh, throughout the Department of Def Defense, DARPA, Navy, uh, DISA, et cetera. Uh, Colleen Laughlin, uh, to his right, is um, currently the Strategic Advisor for Military Technology and Innovation for the Secretary of Defense. Uh, she was most recently the Executive Director of the Defense Innovation Board at DOD. She's been a Special Assistant in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for a variety of things, the Director of Canadian Defense Affairs, uh, doing Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, Regional and Foreign Affairs, great, great background. Uh, Whitney McNamara is the VP of, uh, at Beacon Global Strategies. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments uh, and is leading a lot of the emerging technologies and defense portfolio work at the Atlantic Council's Commission on Defense Innovation Adoption. She formerly also was in the Department of Defense within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, also on the Defense Innovation Board, worked for the department's chief information officer, and a variety of other things. Uh, and then finally, Sam Gray, who is currently the executive director of the Silicon Valley Defense Group, which is a nonprofit focused on connecting the people, technology, and capital required to maintain a techno security advantage for the US and allied democracies. He's also a venture partner with Franklin Templeton and a retired naval officer with over 20 years of experience in operations, strategy, acquisition, um, uh, did a lot of work in the, in the Pacific theater, uh, was a fighter pilot who deployed seven times. So as you can see, we have a, a really great uh, lineup here to talk specifically about quantum as a critical <clears throat> dual-use technology. So thank you all very much for being here, for joining me. I'm also really privileged to call each of these people a friend, so it's an even better panel because of that. All right, so we're going to kick it off. Uh, let's start out with, just given everybody's experience up here, what do you think are some of the current myths around quantum technologies from a government perspective? What are we dealing with as we try to educate, as we try to advocate for the continued development but, but adoption of some of these technologies? Maybe we'll start uh, with, with Whitney and Justin in whatever order you prefer. Uh, Justin's a gentleman, so I know he'll let me go first. But <laughs> um, I would say the biggest thing we see from a government perspective, and I'm sure this will resonate with a lot of folks in the audience, is treating quantum like a monolith. 
um, instead of sort of separating it out into use cases and applications. Um, you'll hear a lot in the department, you know, quantum is important, quantum is an emerging technology, but are we talking about sensing, encryption, um, computing, you know, optimization? And the, the trouble with that is that, of course, all of those have different use cases and timelines for maturation. And so I think that's one of the biggest hurdles that the government has in figuring out sort of what applies to me and how might I, I go about procuring it. And I think government officials can be forgiven for thinking that. I think if you're looking at the headlines around quantum, it's, it's here and we're behind, which is true if we're talking about you know, post-quantum cryptography um, in which adversaries are stealing our encrypted data now for when they receive, uh, when they achieve a fault-tolerant computer. And then you also see headlines that say, um, quantum computing really isn't relevant. It's probably not gonna be around for three to 15 years, depending on who you ask. Um, but of course, that's also not totally true, right? There's a lot of nuance there. There's a lot of really useful things people can do with quantum computers now, despite them not being fault tolerant, as you all know. Um, and so I think these conflicting messages really allow government to sort of push to the right, figuring out what applies to them and, and what they should be doing about it. Um, so I'd say those are the two the biggest ones. Totally. And so just building on that excellent point, like that next level of detail is where the goodness is hidden, right? So the government thinks of quantum, and they think this is important, but the government is full of people, uh, the, the most volatile resource of, uh, that we can find anywhere. And, uh, and those people only have a sense of urgency based on a particular use case. And so as we think about quantum as uh, like a technology, it doesn't necessarily apply to any particular office unless we make it. So there are a lot of people out there waiting for a million qubits for it to be uh, like uh, compelling. And, and we, we know that there are uh, quantum supremacy concerns, but there are also incremental improvements that we can show that connect to outcomes. And, and that's a piece that we probably need more of your help with than, than folks in the building leaning forward. So asking for problems, connecting the dots, and then uh, making it not about funding tech, but about funding particular problems that connect to that tech uh, is, is something that the, it, that's where the myths lie for me and that's where the myth busting is probably most rich. So let me actually pull the thread on, on what you both just said and, and, and throw it back to each of you. How would you encourage um, you know, an, an, an industry leader, an academic leader, a team of sort of leaders in the quantum space, whether we're talking about, to your point, Whitney, quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communications capabilities, how would you encourage them to engage, in this case, the Department of Defense, uh, which, as I think everybody in this, in this room and certainly on this stage knows, is really difficult to figure out where do you, where do you start? How do you do that? Is it you see somebody speaking, you know, on a panel at a, at a quantum conference and you, you know, sort of try to trap them in the auditorium or is it you wait for a solicitation? Like, how do we ensure that both those myths start to be busted, as it were, and that they are busted appropriately by the most <coughs> um, relevant uh, leaders who are actually kind of making the cutting edge advances? How would you suggest that people start doing that? I'd say to talk early and often with industry, find folks that are trusted advisors. I think a lot of the times folks are surprised to hear that a lot of these technologies are far more sophisticated and mature than they expect. Um, I get a lot of, I don't think so, when I tell them that the Air Force is already deploying quantum sensing to pretty exciting results. Um, major banks and healthcare organizations are already transitioning to PQC. Um, there's some government contracts already to pilot PQC. Um, and so this idea that it's some distant problem and not something that people are already sort of digging their, their hands into, I think is a big one. Um, and two, right, just, you know, educate yourself, figure out, there's a huge quantum industry, you might only want one particular use case for where you sit, whether you sit in the E-ring of the Pentagon, you sit in the Department of Energy, you sit uh, at a, a naval base, right? There's something that you might want, um, but you have to go out and figure that out and do your market intelligence and then generate requirements. It's not dissimilar to other emerging technology challenges that we have, where it's figure out what the use cases are, figure out their limitations and advantages, um, pilot a program, and again, like pick winners. When someone is demonstrating to you, they add a lot of value, you know, have the money to sort of scale that, that use case. Can I jump in there? Uh, I, I think a piece of that too is uh, deciding which level of disruption your technology is. 
You know, are you Henry Ford trying to replace horses with cars, or are you the Wright brothers trying to replace trains with something people have never been on with an aircraft? And in a lot of these cases, you're, you're, you're disrupting things that already exist, that already have funding lines, particularly when you're talking about, you know, post-quantum encryption, like there are programs in place to protect critical data. So you're just going in and trying to replace the incumbents that are there. You have to still demonstrate a lot of education on the part of your customer. They need to better understand what you're providing. But that's different than I'm creating something completely new and you have to create a completely different funding line to Justin's point, create a whole new office that knows how to go buy that. You need to decide which end of that spectrum you're on because those are totally different pathways. If you're doing the latter, you need to spend a lot more uh, time with sort of think tanks on Capitol Hill, sort of building an understanding that just doesn't exist inside the department or on Capitol Hill, uh, as opposed to disruption where like they already understand we need to protect these assets. I'm just showing them another tool that will allow them to do that. That's a massive oversimplification. Yeah, well, to that point, uh, you <coughs> have to be a, an outright expert in the government, uh, but it helps to know for, for navigation's sake uh, exactly where you'd like to kind of attack the problem. So if we think about the law of diffusion innovation, if we're going after those innovators, if we're going after that bottom 3%, this is NSF, this is uh, like uh, some of those funds that are early stage, chunk those down, right? So, uh, hey, we want um, uh, delusion refrigeration problems, right? Like that's America's seed fund, but it's only ever little dollars. It's low technology readiness level. If we're going to talk to uh, folks who could be either early adopters, that middle chunk, or uh, where government most often is, is late adopters, and we're trying as a group here to move from late adopters to the left side of that bell curve, get over the hump backwards, how you do that, that archetype is completely different. And so figuring out who to talk to and how to kind of pit them against each other as you navigate this market uh, is something that we can do based on problems as opposed to technology. Yeah, and Jackie, I think on this too, you know, as you have both the science and the technology evolving, you have, the, have your research happening with academia, but then also making sure we balance that. And I think kind of there's a dynamic approach to this where you want to be fueling the science and technology, but then also the application and adoption and experimentation and making sure we're doing those sort of uh, in tandem or at least um, not, not laying them out in such a linear process that uh, you then forego advantages you could gain. So, I mean, that's a great lead into uh, another question that I think a lot of people often ask at fora like this, which is, what are the use cases that are sort of both most compelling from a defense and national security perspective right now, and also kind of temporally the most relevant today, but also, you know, thinking very, very um, poignantly about those that, to the myth question, may actually be closer, <laughs> closer than they appear, um, and will be incredibly compelling in the next few years. Anybody that wants to start. I'll say for me, there's three that really jump out. Um, one, of course, is quantum sensing, uh, which of course is really helpful for assured precision navigation and timing. We expect that in a conflict, GPS is probably gonna be contested. Um, and so many ways that we can be have redundant PNT is gonna be really, really critical for us to be able to do any military operation. But I think there's even more specific examples of quantum sensing, how it could enable more distributed and disaggregated force structures to figure out where they are and where they're going without GPS. I find it really exciting to think about what it looks like for a GP, I'm sorry, um, a quantum sensing, quantum sensor on a munition, a precision guided munition. Um, because it doesn't rely on outside sensors, there's no countermeasure to prevent it from reaching its target, uh, which sounds like a small problem, but I think getting missiles into theater is extremely logistics heavy. We assume that maybe more than half of missiles won't reach their target uh, because of countermeasures. Um, and so this becomes a really strategic problem from an industrial-based perspective, from a budget perspective. And so even just quantum sensors there um, could have tremendous, tremendous impact. 
I'd say the second is post-quantum cryptography. Um, it's certainly unsettling to think that adversaries are stealing our data today uh, to decrypt later when they have a fault-tolerant computer. Um, and back to the myths as well, I, I think it feels very daunting for government officials to think about migrating to PQC, um, but what they may not realize is that there's already sort of ways to take inventory uh, of your networks, determine what assets you might want to protect, and there's guides out there to think through what it looks like to migrate when you're ready at a pretty like <coughs> modest uh, capital amount to do so. And so there are ways to start empowering government folks to make um, uh, steps in that direction. And then the last one would be material science, which really applies to just a wide variety of USG missions. Um, new materials could mean more efficient, more flexible, more resilient materials for the military. It could mean lighter tanks and other platforms. Um, it could find alternatives for critical mi minerals. Uh, we're re redesigning batteries. So there's just a huge, huge amount that I think that we haven't tapped into. Great. Thank you very much. Um, because my assumption is that you all have spent the last three days actually hearing a lot about some of these use cases and some of the most compelling use cases, I actually want to leverage the expertise of this panel to have a different conversation, hopefully, than, than, than one that you've heard to date now, which is, you know, how, <coughs> how should we be thinking about and how should everybody in here be thinking about the hurdles to adoption uh, at scale of this technology or any dual-use technology, but obviously today we're, we're specifically focused on, quant focused on quantum technologies. Um, Colleen and Sam, do you want to sort of start, start the conversation here? Yeah, so yeah, um, you know, when we think about the adoption of dual-use technologies, uh, particularly in DoD, um, it's not just thinking discreetly about that technology, but the ecosystem around this, and I know the ambassador also referenced this, right? It's about thinking the materials, the infrastructure, and the talent, and I think that in particular is, um, in addition to adoption and use cases, some of the space that's really hard for government to imagine and where um, industry, I think, is a really uh, key uh, player in helping us understand um, what that is going to look like. So I would say that ecosystem to me, not just the technology, but the broader um, sector. And so but on that, <clears throat> there are two kind of coincidental inconvenient advantages. One is, you know, while uh, quantum is, uh, you have brand recognition, it's on the critical technologies for government-wide and for DOD, so we all know quantum is good, uh, and then that is where uh, the, the depth or, uh, or the um, knowledge really diffuses. And so taking it to that next level of education is really about the public-private partnership of, number one, it's asynchronous. You're going to get funding from one source and then another, and so it's it's very much like slalom skiing. But the uh, cones were set up by either a, a five-year-old or someone who's drunk, right? Uh, this is <laughs> this is the excitement of uh, doing this. It, it ends up in in the case of semiconductors, in the case of a lot of dual use, it ends up working out. But uh, there's no clear path, and that's the second one is. Uh, this is fairly uncharted because the number of people who are holistically thinking about this are certainly fewer than you think, right? Everyone cares about their piece, and the people who are assembling that together are uh, a handful of people whose names you know and then the people in this room. And so just never, I'd encourage you to never overestimate how those dots connect. You're forming the ecosystem. You're informing problems. You're bringing those to those folks. You're forming connections. I meet with government folks more often because an industry person connects us or a think tank connects us than people I meet in the hallways of the Pentagon or scheduled meetings. So uh, the mapping of the ecosystem and how we think about our funding profile and the maturation of the technology is it's a sport and it can be a beautiful sport, but it is not an organized sport. It's, uh, it's more like uh, rugby than football. I think, <coughs> I think a good technology to use as, a, as, as an example is artificial intelligence, where the DoD and government has been talking for years about how critically important this would, would be, how it would be a game-changing technology, just like quantum, it's a potential existential threat, a winner-take-all or winner-take-most type technology but we didn't really see a lot of movement by government. We saw a lot of discussion around 
morality and ethics of AI, a very important question to have, but it should be done in parallel to moving forward. It took industry to sort of kick open the door and demonstrate with ChatGPT when suddenly everybody was like, oh, this now has reached that critical point where I can clearly see how that technology works, how it potentially could impact me. So what I always tell companies when I'm talking with them is you ultimately have to be solving a problem for government. Whether that problem is like very real and visceral, they can feel it right in front of them. At SVDG, we use the MRAP example from 2008 when they needed to create these mine-resistant vehicles. You know, the, the stop gaps came off and money flooded into the companies that could provide them. They built a new company out of nowhere and the private markets came and funded Force Protection, that company. There's a whole book you can read on this. We're seeing a little bit of that happen with AI right now. And our hope is that quantum will do that hopefully faster, particularly in that we haven't heard, and we had this discussion last week on the Hill, um, that we haven't really heard that reticence from the government <coughs> that there was like a morality or an ethics issue behind quantum. They know like they just need this technology. And maybe picking up on both of what you um, gentlemen said, you know, it's not just I think the talent in, in, in folks understanding quantum, it's understanding how the workforce uses it, right? You don't need an operator to be a quantum expert, you need the operator to know how to use and apply whatever the capability is that they're trying to use to solve the problem. And so, there, you know, there is a distinction there too, and the talent that's required to uh, develop and uh, advance and um, de-risk, but then also how do you educate a workforce to use these capabilities, which is kind of on the AI front, you know, we sort of sit around and think you're gonna sprinkle AI on something right. or sprinkle quantum on something and you know we're all gonna figure it out, but uh, there, there really is a heavy workforce education adoption process there that we need to get ahead of. And it also is self-reinforcing from the workforce <clears throat> standpoint. Like, I mean, you basically can't go to a graduate program without you know, meeting 20 people that are studying AI because they're seeing in the market that's where the jobs yep. are. We haven't seen that explosion yet in quantum. I'll footstep to the private-public partnership that Justin said. It sounds trite, but particularly for these, you know, emerging technologies or leap-ahead technologies, I really think the onus is on the industry to tell the government the so what, right? If you go to a meeting and you say, hey, my quantum computer can, you know, like analyze, you know, 15 terabytes of information in 15 minutes, they'll say, that's really cool, good for you. But if you say, you know, this can help you manage logistics 33% faster, and like you really have to figure out what the department's missions are, what their challenges are, um, and really sort of like walk the horse to the water, as they say. And then I would say it's really on the government to just send a lot more coherent demand signal. Um, and two, I know there is just tremendous amount of R&D in the private sector, but I think folks are waiting to mature that or commercialize that based on the demand signals they're getting. So the Navy might say, well, I would really love an, a, a quantum algorithm to help with logistics. And they'd say, well, great, but that costs time and money and talent, and so we haven't done that yet. We're waiting for you to tell us that's something that is important to you. Um, and watch the, you know, watch the dollars and the R&D funnel to that. Um, and then to Colleen's point, too, you really need that interplay to say, okay, I'm piloting this program. It's actually really helpful, but I need the quantum sensor to be a bit more resilient for this price point. Or I'm finding quantum computing really helpful, but I don't have the talent to manage the data that's coming off of it. And that way, when government is ready to procure these technologies, it's very well aligned. The whole tech ecosystem is set up to really leverage the capability. Yeah, and we're, you know, we're gonna go into sort of this demand signal and funding discussion now, but I, you know, <coughs> moderator's privilege for a moment. This is, this is my greatest fear, frankly, the conversation that we are having right now and, and that we've just had coming out of the DOD's AI center on the leadership team and kind of watching the last five years of the department who really has, which really has been leading the federal government. Um, and we are still, frankly, you know, behind the power curve in a technology that is much more ubiquitous and arguably much better understood by most, including policymakers, than, than what we're talking about here. This is, this is why I joined SciQuantum. This is why I joined a quantum computing company coming out of, you know, 18 years in the government is because I'm nervous about how lagging we are in technologies that are going to change the face of how we live, much less work. Uh, and so I do sort of really share the perspectives of my colleagues here in 
you know, a prior government, full-time government hat, and, and certainly in my current hat, in terms of really encouraging everyone here to be incredibly proactive and incredibly thoughtful in how you approach the government, especially from that sort of use case and making it really tangible perspective. And I know there are a lot of things that we still don't know, right? And we're still very much sort of testing. But even, you know, taking the time to read the mission statements and the sort of previous solicitations of components that you're visiting with, I think will help industry and academia really vector more tightly towards the problems that are going to resonate. I cannot tell you how many times um, the, the director of the AI Center and I and our leadership team took briefs from industry and took demos that had very little um, other than a, a really exquisite looking you know, dashboard or, or, <laughs> or something to look at, um, very little to do with kind of what we knew were the demand signals coming out of the government that were frankly fairly public facing. So just to kind of hit that point a little bit more, I think it's really important. All right, so let's talk about funding deep tech and funding quantum technologies. Who's, who's responsible here? Uh, is, it, is it government, R&D? Is it, is it capital markets? Uh, what should sort of that, that ratio of the signal uh, and the messaging and the poll look like from private capital, from grants? W what should we be expecting? What are we seeing? And, and how should this kind of move to the point of the Hill conversation last week? I mean, I think this is a yes and, uh, right, <laughs> answer. Um, uh, and I think picking up on your point, right, um, uh, this being one of our priorities, the national defense level, national security strategy, um, needing the government needing to put out the signals and to just drive market interest and drive um, the why, the business case. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we talk about deep tech, um, uh, maybe I'll say something provocative. I think the government has forgotten a little bit how to drive deep mm. tech. Um, and so we are relearning that muscle, um, right? Uh, there was a time when government was exclusively developing technologies, understanding use cases, and then trickling it into the commercial sector. And now you have that happening on both the commercial side and the government side. And how you reduce the friction and, and incentivize and align the incentives on that, I think is gonna be um, important. You know, on the investor side, um, and I know Sam will have much more uh, eloquent, uh, eloquent comment to say on this, but um, you know, investors are looking for quick returns. And so again, right, having to draw in what is the use case, how would an operator, how would the Department of Defense use this, the experimentation, you, you know, aligning all of these pieces in this dynamic um, process while you're uh, still learning the science, the technology, and then we haven't even talked about the regulation piece, right? Like, which is another angle that the government's gonna come in on. And so it's an uncertain market and space, and I think in, in that degree of uncertainty is where government has to kind of step in and, and, and uh, lean forward. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I think investors, just like industry, are not monolithic. I mean, there's a spectrum of investor class. There's angel investors, venture capital, growth stage, private equity, uh, all the way up to the public markets. So the answer really, it kind of depends on who you're talking about. At the earliest stage, I think there is a very strong role of government that they should sort of be the seed fund, to use Justin's term, like, you know, kind of push things out there, understanding you're doing basic research. You are attempting to produce things that don't exist down the road. Uh, later on, it is really the company's responsibility. They have to earn the right to fund down the road. And I think in a lot of these companies, yours included, like, we're getting to that stage where we're getting closer to production, you know, to use the, the structure of the DOD, we're leaving the R&E space and we're getting into the acquisition and sustainment. And this is, you know, a very common, you know, sort of talking point that you're hearing from the DOD, from Capitol Hill, and even now from industry is like, it's really all about production. What can you do at scale? And things at scale are just a very different beast. So you're getting to a different investor class where they're not gonna be really excited about a cyber. You know, even a phase three is sort of like, okay, that's not a program of record. Um, I think this is a case where the industry has gotten ahead of where DOD in particular, but government overall is ready to fund. And the days of, you know, zero interest rate free money is <coughs> very much over as a lot of people in this room know. 
Uh, so it's going to be a lot harder to fundraise. Valuations are coming down, and there aren't programs in place right now to show the type of revenue that that class of investor are going to expect to see. So then that becomes you know, one of those nebulous areas where government needs to build something new. And we're seeing some attempts to do this with programs like the Office of Strategic Capital, like a greater, you know, a hedge fund at DIU, uh, the AppFit program. All of these have pieces that can send a little bit stronger signal as we wait for the revenue to come from other spaces. I'd say, too, that one thing I worry about is when government says, well, we're waiting for winners to emerge. Um, and sometimes, though, what happens is, especially with capital-intensive technologies, the winners will just be those with the deepest pockets and not those that necessarily have the best technology. Right. I also think we take for granted, I think we have a, a wonderfully dynamic and robust quantum industrial base, but again, we treat it like a monolith. We say, well, we have 50 quantum computing companies, so just wait for a few of them to emerge. But what I think we lose sight of is like, well, a lot of those are different modalities, right? Um, and so one may emerge as a winner um, in that they're going to achieve a fault-tolerant computer first. But I think what we'll probably find is that different modalities have different pros and cons, right? Do you want distance for quantum communications? That's one modality. Do you want um, something that's super accurate? Uh, that's another modality. If you want something just good enough that's not too finicky, that's a third modality. And so, and two, I can count on one <laughs> hand with fingers left over the amount of companies in the U.S. seriously working on quantum sensing. So my fear is that by the time the government decides what it wants to buy, it might not have as many options as it thinks it's going to have. And so I think that's another sort of challenge is Yes, we have a very strong quant industrial base. Don't take it for granted. And just get smarter about what that actually looks like when you break it down into use cases and applications. And, and I think, too, if I can tack on, um, is really thinking about also, um, you know, not only the U.S. quantum industrial base, but that of our allies and partners mm -hmm. and where we can leverage. And again, this is that trifecta of government, industry, and academia because they are all sort of moving, right, dynamically across time to... Um, to de-risk or take the certainty, right, the uncertainty out of the science and then push it into the technology that's going to be used uh, by, uh, by the operator or the end user. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's an attacker's world. Uh, so uh, whoever is more aggressive here is going to get across the valley of death sooner. Um, it, the government intrinsically is uh, reactive, and then I wouldn't say they're intrinsically a bad communicator, but if... Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. As handshaking goes, uh, if we are relying on the government's clear message as opposed to, we're better at feedback than clear messaging, right? And so if you start the dance, uh, then we might be able to follow. It might be a little bit more constructive, but that involves some navigation, that involves some plotting of the different pieces. But realistically, there's no them. Uh, it's, it's just us, we're, we're thinking through this and piecing together a story. And so uh, one of my best friends is a, an economist and we argue often about whether it's a technology problem or an economics problem, this and others. And really I think this might be as much a storytelling problem as anything. And so that, that would be the third leg here is if we can connect this to, we talked about talent management equipping the workforce for quantum. We have huge talent management problems in terms of gaps. So if this was a solution to talent management problems, right? If this reduces the load of the 100 extra billets I got but I'm not going to be able to hire for, if this allows us to do things that, not that we couldn't do before, but that we are doing right now uh, disruptively and easier, if this ties into some automation and reduced burden, that uh, if there's, like, as we think about the diffusion innovation, if there is some uh, divest to reinvest after we get those upfront investments, that's what pieces together a story so that we can tie in OSC. Um, on the out year stuff, uh, Jacqueline mentioned ARPA-H. Hey, we're looking at a 10 to 14 year horizon and there's some funding there. So healthcare and medical applications, there's some. But uh, as we start to get to scale that Sam talked about and how we get to production, those are different piece points. Those are completely different archetypes. And so tying those together with the respective stories gets us there much faster. We know how this goes. It's, it's harder with capital intensive ones. And so that matters even more. So just in the last few minutes that we have, um, you can't enter a federal building. You can't read a, you know, a defense focused article in this town without hearing 
you know, China as a pacing threat. That's the reality for the Department of Defense, for sort of our national security apparatus, <clears throat> especially in light of our sort of desired and critically necessary partnership with our allies. How should we be thinking about quantum competi competitiveness vis-a-vis -a, -vis a competition with China? Uh, especially given that quantum progress is not linear, so that we could be very surprised to find ourselves in a very different position a year or 24 months from now. I'll jump in. I, I think it's a big piece of what a lot of us have set up here, <laughs> is it's the storytelling aspect of it, right? It, you need to give them a reason. Uh, you know, a trillion dollars into the national security budget sounds like a lot of money, it certainly is, but when you whittle it down, all of us have worked in government, you know, worked in the DOD, you know, at the end of the day, every office, it feels like you're fighting for every nickel. So, like, th these are, you know, there's just a lot of demand. There's 14 critical technology areas of which quantum is just one of them. So, using that threat and the fact that this is a potentially, ex you know, you know, Existential threat is just a, it's a hard word to use, because but it really is. If we lose this race, you pair it with artificial intelligence, all these things, you can find yourself so far behind, it's, it's very difficult to catch up. And I think using that without, you know, sort of doing the boogeyman, like you have to be afraid of everything, but realizing if this blindsides us, it could be a very large problem. But doing that in a very uh, clear way of how your solution solves their problem. You have to like walk them all the way to that water of like, this is solving a problem for you. It is something, think about you are taking away from other program dollars every time you get a contract. It is a very, very competitive market. You need to think about it that way. You're not just competing with the other technologies in your space, you're competing with all of the technologies because you need to prove what I'm building is so critical it requires taxpayer dollars as opposed to the other things where you could be spending them. Yeah. I feel totally empathetic to government officials <coughs> and congressional staffers that are getting briefings that say biotech is it, quantum is it, AI is it, it's all existential, it's all urgent, we're behind on all of it. And by the way, all of it requires a lot of money. Um, and so I think this is why that communication back and forth has to be really important. I also think too, what I hear sometimes from government is that they think industry is overselling them. Um, you know, that that tech roadmap is, is way too optimistic. And so I think, too, industry has a really important role of being sort of like, what, like to borrow a phrase, like the adults in the room. Like, this is hard, right? Like, don't say like, oh, I'm just going to come in there and I'll put a quantum sensor and we're going to, no, 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 it's hard. It's hard. We've accumulated the best talent globally, right, to be able to deliver this capability. Um, here are some pitfalls. Here are some limitations that we hope to overcome in the next couple of years, but here's where it sits now. And so I think really just, uh, you know, explaining it, adding nuance, what's the narrative? And the narrative is not quantum is important. It's a big boogeyman. It's here are some really compelling use cases that are available now. Here's how you might procure them. Here's some of the problems they might solve. Um, and I appreciate, I, I think the emerging tech space has never been more crowded and noisy. And so it's even more important for government and industry to have those really frank tactical conversations um, about sort of the state of play and what we can be doing about it. I, I think um, like to commend this room, I, I think this is going better uh, noticeably better than it was two or three years ago in terms of bringing those cases forward. I, I uh, uh, am notably annoyed at, at times at the 5G next G where we're um, like building and then the killer app will come later. I was at Apple last week uh, and I saw the Vision Pro and you know like they're still thinking through use cases and uh, like the, it's, it's feely, right? Uh, you guys are bringing forward those. Um, to, to Whitney uh, and Sam's point, like um, uh, existential threats, if they're not uh, local and tangible, are more paralyzing than they are compelling. So uh, like just saying the same thing louder and louder uh, doesn't work anywhere. And so I, I think this group has recognized that, uh, leaning in and educating the people that you need to at those respective points and tailoring that message uh, is a huge deal. Um, and then everyone can tell the higher level story, but it's going to be those sub stories that connect the dots. Yeah, I think when we think about tech competition um, with uh, adversaries, you know, there are lots of tools the government can use to kind of uh, blunt uh, some of that, whether it's export controls. I mean, we've seen, you know, uh, the White House Department of Commerce uh, take some actions in that space. 
Um, but I think this kind of gets back to where you started this conversation of, you know, it really is the virtuous uh, cycle or relationship between industry, government, and academia. Like, you just have to outpace. Uh, I don't know if it's so much that you need to slow down, but speed up on our side. And again, right, leveraging uh, that, that, that broader uh, ecosystem that also includes right, allies and partners, and um, we can leverage kind of everyone's strengths um, and advantages there. Perfect. We are going to leave it there. Thank you all so much for your time, and thanks for having us.